Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. The finding of his DNA wasn't just on the murder weapon. It was on a most important part of the murder weapon. This evidence was the breakthrough that we needed. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science brought the most dangerous killers to justice. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. It's a hammer blow. You don't know how you're going to carry on. We'll hear how some of the most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. He basically said to me, she's in the house, go and find her. The amount of blood that was there indicated that there was a, a frenzied attack. There was no reasonable explanation for them. That's why he changed his plea. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. The key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. I was so elated beforehand. We didn't have the evidence and all of a sudden we'd cracked it. In this episode, police attend the scene of what appears to be an accidental house fire. Miraculously, a child survives. Firemen came and they asked me if it was a big or a small fire, and I said, it's a big fire. But tragically, her mother does not survive, and when forensic investigators examine the scene, clues emerge that not all is as it seemed. The burning in the bed uh, should have been mainly remained on the surf top surface of the bed, but I could see burning to the left-hand side bottom of the bed. We saw that that area of the neck had not been burned. I phoned up the detective inspector at Stevenage and I told him, we have got a murder on our hands. This is Forensics, Catching the Killer. Tuesday, 4th of March, 1980. In the large Hertfordshire town of Stevenage, fire crews received a call about a house fire in the suburbs. The public reported the flames, and a passing milkman took the brave step of breaking his way in after hearing screams from inside someone was trapped upstairs. There was a fire at the end of the bed and I was in the bed with my mum and I was just felt paralysed and in shock and really wanted my mum to move and do something but she wasn't moving. I then don't remember actually getting out of the bed, but I found out that I did get out of the bed because the milkman rescued me on the stairs. He saw smoke bellowing out of the bathroom window, the upstairs bathroom window. So uh, he came near to the door and he heard my screams and crying and he knocked the door down and he came and rescued me. Amanda Wright was just four years old at the time when she lived in the house with her mum, 25-year-old Susan Lawson. I just remember being on the stairs with him and him carrying me, and I remember looking down at my feet and legs and they were all burnt and blistered. And there's like a big bl bubble blister on my ankle. He took me next door and the firemen came and they asked me if it was a big or a small fire, and I said, it's a big fire. As fire services tackled the blaze, Amanda was rushed to hospital for immediate treatment to the burns on her legs. But once the flames were extinguished, 
what emergency crews discovered in this quiet suburban street was more sinister than just a fire. At the time, it was uh, mainly sort of a council property. It's completely residential. And uh, it was a, not a bad area at all. It was uh, actually pretty much as you see it now. Peter Harper was a young detective constable at the time. He was about to make a shocking discovery. What I found was uh, the house had been not seriously damaged uh, or internally, but the bedroom, the top floor rear bedroom was in actual fact pretty uh, badly burnt. And I found that there was a body of a woman uh, actually lying in the bed, obviously dead. As Peter began to make an initial assessment of the room, some aspects of it didn't make sense. May have been caused by smoking in bed, but there was a few issues that uh, I didn't particularly like, which sort of uh, triggered me a little bit. The burning in the bed uh, should have been mainly remained on the surf top surface of the bed, but I could see burning to the left-hand side bottom of the bed. The neck curtain was down on the floor, and the cord that was holding the curtain up was down by the side of the bed, totally untouched by the fire. Uh, no burn or scorch marks anywhere near it yet. The main curtains were burnt and singed, which led me to think, well, that was down before the fire started. But not everyone involved agreed with the detective constable. They actually did call out a forensic scientist who did an examination of the fire. And he didn't agree with my interpretation, but he's the expert. And so they went with that, that the fire started on the top of the bed and not under the bed. I've seen bodies where they have uh, died in chairs, armchairs, where they have been smoking, and the, the mere fact that they've had a cigarette in their hands, they've fallen asleep, the hands dropped, the cigarette's gone into the material in the, in the bed, and it's caught fire, and, they, and sometimes people don't wake up to that incident and, and die naturally in the fire. Back in 1980, we didn't have combustion modified furniture, which is what we have today. Everybody's sofa has a little label on it that says it's cigarette and match resistant. The reason we have these, these labels is because back in the 1980s, we were having significant problems where people were dropping matches and cigarettes on sofas or in rubbish bins and that sort of thing, and they were catching their sofas alight. Since then, we have combustion modified furniture, so it changes the way fires burn. So back in 1980, fires would develop very quickly. You could easily get to um, flashover, which is where the entire room is on fire. You could get to that stage within a matter of a few minutes. There are certainly tests that have been done with furniture from the 1980s that flashover happens in around four minutes. Away from the bedroom, Peter's search of the home continued to arouse suspicion. I went downstairs into the sort of the lounge area. There was two cups and two plates, um, which obviously had been used prior to the fire. And it struck me that it was two plates and cups that had been used by adults rather than a, a mother and child. You know, there wasn't the right crockery for a, a four-year-old to be you know, drinking or eating out of. That didn't ring right to me, so I preserved that scene um, as a separate scene and preserved those items.
Peter's inquiries now switched to the mortuary, where a forensic pathologist was called in to examine Susan's body. Initially, when, when we thought about it, could have been an, uh, an intentional ploy to actually burn her on that part of the body to start with. Because one of the interesting things was when we moved her neck up away from her chest because, because the head had contracted down to her chest, we moved it up, we saw that that area of the neck had not been burned. And it was within that area that we found signs of uh, strangulation. I realised then, obviously, my suspicions were, were correct. I phoned up the detective inspector at Stevenage and I told him, we have got a murder on our hands. In March 1980, a house fire in Stevenage almost claimed the life of four-year-old Amanda Wright. Her mother was not so lucky. 25-year-old Susan Lawson's body had been found in the burnt-up bedroom of her home. But a post-mortem examination revealed strangulation, not fire, as the cause of her death. News of the murder quickly spread. Stevenage is divided into a number of different neighbourhoods um, and, yeah, people would be friendly within the neighbourhood, but you would never leave your door open in Stevenage. Brian Todd was a detective sergeant at the time. It was a, a lot of youngsters in the town. We had a, a bit of a drugs problem, like most towns. There was a, a number of burglaries to deal with. Wherever you've got drug offences, you've got burglaries and thefts and shoplifting for people to finance their, their drug addiction. But um, it was a normal town, nothing out of the ordinary. But mother and daughter lived in a peaceful area and had a contented home life before the night of the tragedy. My early childhood was very happy. I spent it with my mum, mainly with my mum, because it was me and her, because my dad left when I was about two years old. My mum was like free-spirited, young at heart. We'd wear hats and put bags on and coats and mess around and we'd like dance and just have lots of fun and go to the park. And yeah, just uh, a happy, chilled out, secure time in my life. Of course, Amanda was very young, so Susan couldn't work. I believe she had uh, lodgers to pay the bills, so that helped her to get by. Katie Whites was an author who would later go on to write a book about Amanda and her mother, Susan. She'd gone through a sad period. She'd married David Lawson, when she was pregnant with Amanda. And unfortunately, the relationship hadn't worked out, which was a source of sadness for her. But she was very happy to be a mother, and according to Amanda, she was very devoted and very loving. She used to take her out all the time to a place called the Lakes in Stevenage, where they used to play in the playground, and she was always, you know, very devoted. She wouldn't let Amanda out of her sight. And she lived on her own, so she was quite independent, although she had her parents round the corner from her, and she saw them off. And apart from that, she didn't go out much. She was a stay-at-home mum. The lakes was just on our doorstep, literally, so a short walk. We'd go to the park and my mum would push me on the swing, which I absolutely loved, and then we'd go to the big slide. I've got lots of nice photos of us together. Um, sometimes I'd be dressed up in like a ballerina outfit, 
pink one and uh, I'd be like doing little poses in the garden. She loved music, Motown, and she liked soul and she liked pop music, David Bowie. She liked horses, she had a horse, and she loved animals. She wrote some beautiful poems that I ended up getting, which were brilliant for me. Gave me a source of strength growing up and going through my teenage years. The deadly events in their home that night, including the fire, would have far-reaching consequences for Amanda. She had quite serious burns on her lower legs, and back then, in 1980, skin grafts were still a relatively new procedure, and a specialist surgeon was brought in from London to complete the operations. There were skin grafts taken from her thighs, and they were put on her lower legs, and she was in hospital for quite some time. I'd be in excruciating pain when they were unraveling the bandages because the blood stick to the burns and the bandage. And then when they pulled it apart, it hurt so much. And I remember just hating knowing that that was going to happen, like if I was having a bath, and the smell of it as well. It had like a disinfectant smell, really strong smell. And uh, I'd have to soak the bandages and I'd be like, please just let me soak them for longer. I always wanted longer. I never wanted them to unravel them. Um, but the nurses were really lovely and were like um, understanding and patient with me. Uh, but it wasn't nice at all. While Amanda was undergoing painful medical care, in the mortuary, forensic pathologists were discovering more clues as to how Susan had died. The pathologist said that um, there were bruises and cuts on all around Susan's body. There was a ligature mark and sign of strangulation on the neck. And clearly, whoever did this was also um, punching and hitting Susan consistent with the injuries over her chest and face. Susan's body was starting to reveal some truly harrowing injuries. But the attending pathologist, Peter Venezes, had to find hard evidence of exactly what killed the young mother. In a victim that dies from a fire, we need to be, first of all, sure that that person had died as a result of a fire or whether they had died, or whether they were dead before the fire occurred. And to do this, we have to look at uh, the blood. We have to look carefully internally at their air passages. If, for example, they've, they've inhaled smoke from the fire, they will have soot within their airways and their airways will appear black. And also in the blood, they would have uh, inhaled the products of combustion in a fire, which would be carbon monoxide. But in addition to that, we also look for small spots in the eyes and face. In this case, we couldn't see anything in the face because it was burnt. But in the eyes, when we lifted up the eyelids underneath, the whites of the eyes, we could see uh, on, on the small areas around the whites of the eyes, small red spots. These are known as petechiae. And these are very common findings in strangulation. All the evidence was pointing to foul play, rather than fire being the cause of Susan's death. Once I looked at the neck area, and once I was able to uh, look into the eyes and also dissect the neck and see what was going on underneath. In addition to that, by not seeing any soot in the airways at all, um, all the only thing that was left then was to make sure the carboxyhemoglobin, the carbon monoxide, was very low, and it was. So he was confident that whoever did this 
not only tied a, a ligature around the neck, but also used his hands to try and kill Susan. But with badly injured four-year-old Amanda unable to provide detectives with any clues, would they ever be able to find the man who murdered her mother, Susan? In March 1980, four-year-old Amanda Wright was miraculously rescued from a house fire in Stevenage. Amanda's mother, Susan, had been found dead in the wreckage of the blaze. But as investigators had discovered, she had actually been strangled before the property was set alight. I believe this was quite a shocking occurrence in what was a small and friendly and tight-knit community. And because the fire had concealed the fact that there had been a murder, the police then tried to engage the local community to catch the killer. They put out appeals in the local paper in the Stevenage Comet to ask and engage and ask the people if they'd seen anything, if they had noticed anything unusual, maybe they had sat next to the killer on the way to work, maybe they'd seen somebody coming and going from the house. There were general appeals for eyewitnesses as well as to try and find the perpetrator. A man had been seen running away by the milkman um, who was able to give a description. And over the next 48 hours, Amanda was able to tell us that she'd seen the man there, um, that he had uh, been shouting at her and had run off. Young Amanda was now starting to claw back her memories of the horror in her home that morning. And the first thing I remember was hearing the alarm going off. It was a constant bell ringing alarm on the clock. And then when I woke up, I could see that the man was at the bottom of the bed and he was getting dressed. He was sort of hurriedly hurrying along, seemed in a bit of a rush. And my mum was next to me in the bed. And then suddenly, just out of nowhere, he just sort of came flying over towards my mum and grabbed her out of the bed and pulled her out. And then he was attacking my mum and strangling her and she was near the wall and he was smacking her head against the wall. And I was just in bits, I was screaming, crying my eyes out and asking him to stop and he said he won't stop unless I stop crying. I was so desperate to stop crying, but I couldn't. So I was in turmoil, I needed to stop crying, but at the same time, what I could see in front of me was the most horrific thing I'd ever seen. And then after a while, he then stopped attacking her, but my mum was like this side of the room, and then she, they sort of traveled over to this side of the room, near to where I was on the bed. And then he just grabbed me and got a pillow and pushed it over my face. And I just remember feeling his hands on my neck. And then I knew like, I couldn't breathe. Uh, and then after a while, I just wanted it all to be over with. And then after that, I came round and my mum was back in bed with me. And there was a fire at the bottom of the bed and my mum wasn't moving. She wasn't opening her eyes. and that I must have lost consciousness because it went blank. And then it seemed so different when I came round to how it was like before. So, and, and then with my mum back in the bed with me and the fire and yeah, and, and she couldn't move and I just wanted her to open her eyes. 
and I was really tempted to get my fingers and pull her eyes open. But at the same time, I felt like I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything, and I was obviously very scared. I can't even begin to imagine the terror that she must have felt in that moment, knowing that the person who had cared for and looked after and loved her her whole life was now gone. And in fact, in her four-year-old mind, I don't think it really computed. I think she felt that if she could just wake her mother up, it would all be all right. But the fire, of course, just got bigger and it was climbing higher and filling up the room. And I think the next thing that she recalls is being taken out of the house by a man and taken round to her neighbor's house where she was put on a sofa, telling that man, my mummy's still inside, my mummy's still in the house. In the days that followed, forensic investigators at the crime scene were struggling to find any evidence that could identify Susan's killer. There wasn't any blood as such, not from the uh, suspect. You, you were very restricted in what you could find in those days. You know, there was obviously, you could find fiber evidence, things like that, but when it's gone up in smoke and flames, you, you, that side of it goes out the window. But there was one tiny shred of forensic evidence they did find and it was one of the oldest and most trusted sciences in police forensics. There is a procedure for getting fingerprints from items within fire scenes. Now, everybody has seen the use of what we call a, a squirrel brush with powder on it in order to, to expose fingerprints. In fire scenes, you can still use that same technique if it's something that is away from the area of burning. If it's within the area of burning or if it's within the room of origin and is smoke stained or sooty, there are other techniques that can be used. And one of them is to use the soot on the item itself as a developing powder. So you would brush the soot and the fingerprint self develops with the soot. Could the pair of mugs, originally spotted by Peter at the home, hold the murderer's prints? We've got our own little um, search lab area and we've got a drying cabinet. So I thought, well, the firemen have been around, they've been hosing everything and it's, you know, the, it's damp. And so you can't fingerprint items when they're damp. So I, I took them back to the police station, put them in the drying cabinet and I thought, well, I'm going to leave them there for 24 hours. Hoping that some fingerprint evidence had been preserved, Peter's patience paid off. I'm almost certain that I got uh, the victim's fingerprints. And then on the other cup, I found a fingerprint mark. I think it was only just the one. And uh, that was sent to police headquarters, fingerprint department. They put it through the national system and it came back as the, as the suspect. And that gave us the name to give to the investigating team. And then they did the work. They went out there and found him. And that name was John Dickinson. John Dickinson was a local park keeper. He was identified as the main suspect in the murder of Susan Lawson. It came out that he had another conviction for arson in the 70s when he had set fire to his bedsit in Newcastle. He'd been found guilty and convicted, sentenced to a three-year prison term for that crime. So now we have an identification um, on the coffee cup, which probably meant that it was a recent visit by the offender Dickinson to the house. Plus the fact that when we looked at his uh, previous convictions, especially the one for an arson, um, he became 
the main suspect or the only suspect. And very quickly, I was assigned to arrest him and take him into custody. Uh, along with the detective constable, I went to the um, address where he was living, um, arrested him for murder. Um, he, he was quite aggressive, um, as was his wife, um, but we took him to Stevenish Police Station. We knew him locally to be a burglar. Um, he had a previous for violence, so we knew enough about him to think that this is our man. In March 1980, Forensic investigators had recovered a fingerprint at the scene of a murder. 25-year-old Susan Lawson's body had been left in her bedroom with her four-year-old daughter, Amanda, still alive. Then the room had been set alight, but miraculously, Amanda was rescued. Now, police had a suspect whose print matched one found in the victim's house. This is the police station that John Dickinson was brought to. In 1980, he would have been brought in to the cell block. He was held there for several days of interviews. The interview room where he was interviewed was upstairs on the other side of the upper windows, which was the CID office and the interview rooms at the side. He did four interviews. The first one, he denied he'd ever been to 13 Cole Street Close. Um, and that he didn't know, other than a very brief meeting two years before, he didn't know Susan Nelson. The second one, he admitted he was there and that they had... He, he was there for the purpose of trying to get lodgings, that they got on well together. According to him, they had sexual intercourse and about two o'clock in the morning, there was a knocking on the door and a man apparently arrived that he didn't see but he didn't want any aggravation. When Susan went downstairs to let him in, he escaped round the back door. Absolute lies. This was just one version of events told by Dickinson. But he changed his story several times, including one where he claimed to be just a burglar who set fire to the house to hide evidence of his break-in. With his fingerprint placing him at Susan's home and the clear forensic evidence of her being strangled, Dickinson was charged by police. He was brought to trial quite quickly in September 1980 in St Albans Crown Court, where he pled not guilty There was a, a trial of over two weeks and the jury only took 40 minutes to see through his lies and find him guilty of murder, of arson with intent to endanger life, and for which he received a life sentence, a minimum of 18 years. But who was John Dickinson? And why had he murdered Susan? on the night of the 4th of March, 1980. John Dickinson had been living up in Newcastle until he was actually imprisoned for an arson up there. John came to live in Stevenage, where his parents lived. So as far as we know, he was chucked out by his wife and needed to find a place for that night. He turned up at Susan's house.
Susan and uh, Dickinson only met each other once previously, which was two years prior to the offence when um, Dickinson had been at a house when Susan visited someone else. He may have waved at her in the street a couple of times when, when he saw her, but he became aware through other friends that Susan was looking for a lodger. Although Susan made it clear, according to him, on the evening that she only usually took ladies in, not men. I think he had his suitcase with him. My mum was like, well, uh, we'll have to organise that for a date, but he sort of pushed his way in, sort of was, oh, I really need to stay somewhere right now. So my mum was all taken aback. She, she didn't really quite know what was happening. She knew of him, but she felt really unsettled by it. So what she done was that she rang Carol, the lady who used to live with us, and said would, to Carol on the phone, cause back then you just had house phones, she said, would she come round? Uh, because this guy's turned up who needs lodgings. I, you know, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. But Carol said, unfortunately, I'm going out tonight. But I'll definitely come tomorrow. So my mum sort of went, oh, OK, then. So that's, that's how he gained entry into the house. She had, in fact, let in a man with monstrous intentions. He would not only take her life, but also destroy everything which her daughter loved. For Amanda, life would never be the same again. She'd lost her mother, she'd lost her home, and even though she was now going to live with her father, it was not the same loving relationship that she'd enjoyed with her mother. Mum's parents put the grave here, my grandparents, and they put my, my mum with her nan, May, so that she wasn't alone, and she really got on well with her nan. They had a close relationship, so that's why my grandparents wanted her here. It feels like a good thing that I've got good memories of my mum, and also I've got lots of photographs of me and her together, so that, that's brilliant for me as well, because I can see them, I can look at them and know that we had good times, they're real, I can hold them in my hand. So I feel happy that there was lots of photographs taken of us together. So I've got the photographs of my mum, I've got the poems that my mum done. So yeah, that all means a lot to me, it's so precious to me. I do often wonder what my mum would be like now. Um, all through my childhood, I often thought about her and, and I wondered what she would look like, what clothes she would wear, what job she would have, what her interests would be. Yeah, all of that stuff has just been erased. It, it's nev it never happened and it never will happen. So it's just like a massive void of, of, of curiosity, of wondering, but never knowing the answers. John Dickinson spent 34 years in prison for the murder of Amanda's mother. But after his release in 2014, other terrible crimes of historic abuse committed against his own stepchildren, now adults, came to light. The revelation came after one of them was inspired to get in touch with Amanda after hearing her speak out. And I just couldn't believe it. And, uh, and it was nice to talk to her, talk about our feelings and growing up feeling guilty and bad about ourselves. And really, we shouldn't have had to feel like that. And we talked about her getting, like, going to the police about it because he should be punished for this disgusting crime that he's put on them. And uh, it was just swept under the carpet. She'd plucked up the courage and she made that phone call to the police. And then from there, there was investigation and he, a court case and he was put back in prison, which is amazing. So we were really elated with that, that he's back and he can't hurt anyone else. He has been sentenced to another 17 years. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. 
The truth had finally caught up with Dickinson and taken him back to prison once and for all. And that judicial journey all began with the findings of forensic evidence and the initial diligence of one detective at the scene of a house fire. I think what, what stands out for me in this particular case is the fact that um, uh, when you go to a scene where it might look like it's fairly straightforward from the point of view of a house fire, for example, the police could easily have thought that she may have dropped a cigarette near the bed which then set a light. Um, but all credit to them, we kept an open mind. It was the fingerprint evidence that pointed the way to the, to the inquiry that took place afterwards and uh, the successful conviction. So yeah, the forensic evidence was the fingerprint evidence. It worked. Dickinson is known to have hurt three children in different yet equally horrific ways. All are survivors, none more so than the little girl he left alone to die in the fire which he started. I think the worst thing for me was the fact that it wasn't actually the, the murder of the victim, which is horrendous in itself, but it was the fact that someone could lock a four-year-old child in a bedroom and leave her there to burn to death. That, that is the thing that really um, is horrendous. No, I, yeah, I can't even explain the feeling about it, it's just horrible. The man who killed my mum left me a terrified child. I was so scared of him, I knew him as the bad man and for a very, very long time, I just feared him as this big monster that could hurt me. Even today, I still have anxiety, so it's still, it's still with me today. And the sadness of not having my mum and the longing to have my mum will never leave. It never leaves that mother-daughter relationship. It's, it's always there. And if I go through really tough times, I always want my mum.